Uh, hello, uh, Vipul. Hello, uh, Society of Robotic uh, Surgery. Hello, uh, everyone from uh, London. Uh, my name is Prakash Dasgupta, and uh, I am here to give you a summary uh, of uh, the future of surgery as I see it. I found it an incredibly, incredibly inspiring session, uh, which kicked off with me interviewing a couple of legendary surgeons. Uh, Rick Sattava uh, talked about uh, single cell surgery, and we know that we already have the ability to edit genes inside a single cell. This technology is called CRISPR-Cas9 for those who are interested. And then, as if that was not enough, Ara Darzi followed up by talking about fumes that emanate from the end of the diathermy. And I know that during COVID, we all have been using diathermy, which has a covered tip. But you can do metabolomics with these fumes to detect what you're doing at the end of your instruments. This is absolutely amazing. Uh, and I think the work that is being done there uh, is just uh, going out uh, into major journals such as Nature, on the 1st of January this year, we had an amazing uh, piece of uh, artificial intelligence uh, showing that uh, uh, you can actually predict cancers better than human beings, breast cancers, by just using artificial intelligence. So I think the future on that side is amazing. We then uh, followed up uh, with uh, uh, imaging, and I think imaging uh, in the future is of two kinds. One is static, the other is dynamic. Uh, I find it extremely frustrating uh, that we are unable to see and use the images that we have acquired before surgery during the operation itself. And people have been working very hard on it. Uh, spectral imaging, for example, from Christos Bergelis in my own lab using flexible robotics. And then uh, uh, using data science uh, to try and do some dynamic imaging, which came from Italy with uh, Francesco Porpilia. And the challenge there being, the image has to move as the organ moves. For example, if you're operating on the prostate and trying to save the nerve bundles, they do not stay fixed in one place. So I think the challenge for dynamic imaging to, is to actually have the images move as the surgeons operate. The other is static imaging which is 3D printing. You can take a beautiful MRI, get it uh, sliced up, which is called segmentation, and then you 3D print the whole thing into an organ. You take that organ into the operating room and see if you can improve, say, for example, uh, positive margin rates. So that was the imaging side. And then finally, we came to connectivity. Robotics is not really of any use if we can't connect surgeons all over the world. Can we transport the best surgeon from anywhere 5,000 miles away? And the answer is yes, we can. Uh, from my own lab, uh, the professor of telecoms, uh, Misha Dola, uh, talked about 5G, and he's very excited about this, using artificial intelligence to actually shorten the latency time in 5G. I thought that was incredible work, and he is already talking about 6G, beyond 5G. And then we came to what I call the creme de la creme, which is the future is already here. What do I mean by that? During COVID, we've had a really exciting story, a really happy story about doctor sitting all the way in Seattle, 5,000 miles away, using uh, an augmented reality platform called Proximy to guide one of my colleagues, Archie Fernando, in Guy's Hospital in London to do a retroperitoneal robotic lymph node dissection. And guess what? During this session, we had a fireside chat with the patient himself, Mort Tahir, and how real was that bringing the future to the audience today, not in 20 years time. So uh, uh, my friends, this is really my last act as BJUI Editor-in-Chief. As some of you will know, I retire on the 1st of August. Uh, VIP, you have been incredibly supportive of the journal. I hope we have published the best robotic papers that are there in the world, in the BJUI. And I really look forward to meeting you guys face to face sometime in the near future. Bye bye. Awesome. Prokar, thank you so much. Uh, I can tell you, you are definitely a favorite of my organization team. You are always on task and getting everything done. I, I think your session was phenomenal. 
And I'm not sure if you saw on the agenda at the end of your session, I added another session from Dr. Link, and he's the one who actually did the first 5G surgery in China across 3,000 miles. And we Indeed, actually, I saw that. We were actually able to track him down and get him to record, and it's added to your session. So we appreciate so much. Thank you. Very, right. Thanks a lot. Have a great evening. Thank you, guys. Yeah, Justin, I guess you're next. I think you're on mute. Are you asking for me? Yeah. Uh, Justin. No. So, yeah, thank you very much Viv, for the invitation to speak at the uh, Society of Robotic Surgery. And I hope everybody's really enjoying uh, this virtual conference. With any of these uh, uh, conferences that have been postponed due to the pandemic, um, it's actually given us maybe some other opportunities to, to meet with other people and involve them in some of these discussions that uh, we wouldn't have otherwise had the chance to have got everybody together in one place. So we hosted uh, a couple of sessions. Uh, the first one was a telepresence session, and I was delighted to involve uh, Yulin Wang, who is one of the people uh, who, who is the, the, the CEO and founder of Computer Motion that did Operation Lindeberg, uh, the transatlantic operation between New York and France. And the engineer at the time of that was Brian Miller, um, who's uh, a, a vice president now in Intuitive Surgical. So they, they were both present to talk about telepresence and also telesurgery. Uh, and we also had um, Mira Nambari, who's uh, working with NASA and talk, talked about their plans for the uh, Mars landing in 2034 and the need for um, to avoid the round time time delays that you get. So it's 400 millisecond round time delay once you're doing telementoring to the moon. And it's many uh, more minutes once you get to Mars. So actually, this was uh, an indication that telementoring, telesurgery will eventually lead into automation. So they're, plant, they're working on that currently, and they're talking about their plans for 2034. Um, and one of the co-chairs of the meeting was uh, a colleague and friend, Senthil Nathan. And uh, Senthil, as most of you know, was involved in one of the first robotic cases in the 1980s on the ProBot, which was automated surgery for BPH. So it was really nice to have that, uh, the closing of the loop from going from um, uh, talking about telementoring and talking about what uh, Senthil had done with automation and, and seeing that that's where we're, we're going again in the future. Um, and Yannick Bolo was the other person that was involved, and he's uh, set up a, a very successful company in Canada, Reacts, which does uh, telementoring. And currently, they're doing a lot of things with Philips and in echocardiography. But uh, they have some nice functionality that I think will be applicable in robotic surgery as well. So I'm really grateful to the, the group, the way they came together, and we had some very interesting discussions. And I think it uh, it's very timely to talk about telemedicine. Um, you know. COVID has done more in the last six months uh, for the progress of telemedicine than technology has done in the last 10 years. And necessity is a great driver of change. And what we're seeing with the NASA project, they have a necessity to actually progress the telesurgery to automation. So uh, we look forward to their work that they're doing on that. That was very exciting. Um, the other session that I did, uh, we did was uh, with UCL was on novel technologies and training. And one of the principles that we've really tried to push with the different groups and organizations and lots of societies and are involved in this as well as the sort of standardization that, uh, so we, we were trying to enable in the training deliberate practice. And we've done a project this year with Anders Ericsson who unfortunately recently passed away, but uh, I think uh, his memory will live on in a lot of the work and a lot of understanding he's brought to really guide training where we define metrics and, and understand them. Um, and if you have reduced variables and defined metrics, that's good for things like AI. So one of the talks we had in that session was on the ethical implications of AI and surgery. Um, Amagazi did two very nice presentations. One was on 3D printed models. And again, how you integrate those performance metrics into defined 3D printed models. And he talked about things like uh, positive surgical margins with fluorescent staining and even things like tensiometers. Um, so if you think about the importance of not putting too much tension on the neurovascular bundle, that's actually something that's very difficult to define in a patient. So we may be seeing these novel training models that are actually superior 
to learning in patients because you're getting really objective performance feedback that you can evolve your technique with. Um, Ashwin Shadar did a very nice presentation on augmented reality and virtual reality and how that's progressing and how we're, we're using that increasingly in surgical training as well. So I think that was also a fantastic session to look at. Uh, and I think the key messages for, for training and for telepresence, there's a big overlap. It's uh, we need to develop a common language that we agree to and understand that we can really uh, drive training where we have objective metrics and we have a, a, a common agreement between the trainee and the trainer in what is good surgical performance. So thank you very much and uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Justin. We, we definitely appreciate your whole contribution, your dedication and especially your excitement. You can see thank you. <laughs> you are part of the future of surgery and uh, we thank you for kind of pushing this forward for us. Thank you. We live in exciting times. Absolutely. Uh, next, uh, Rick, do you have some words about your sessions? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, we were the lead session, which was about uh, the current status and future predictions for the direction of robotic surgery. Um, we began uh, with a lecture from myself that was uh, emphasizing what is coming beyond robotic surgery and uh, emphasizing the different technologies that are available today in the non-healthcare field. And with a particular emphasis on the use of directed energy for non-invasive surgery uh, called directed energy for diagnosis and therapy or DDAT. Uh, we would need all the preceding uh, technologies that we've been working in uh, over the past 30 to 40 years. Uh, robotics for precision, uh, imaging technologies, uh, and working at the cellular level where the disease actually begins. Uh, we followed this by a lecture from uh, Jacques Marisco he spoke about his work at the Imperial College in London for robotic surgery over the past 30 years, both in the areas of clinical surgery, as well as education and training, and the merging of the two. He spoke about things such as 3D virtual reality from patient-specific CT scans, which allowed for preoperative planning and surgical rehearsal, 3D printing when necessary for complex places to be able to actually print a model out uh, of the procedure that uh, the, the disease that needed to be operated upon. He was looking at newer technologies like microtechnology as well as nanotechnology and soft robotics. Uh, adding to what we have today in robotics and moving them to the next generation with or without adding haptics, which is a very difficult issue. Uh, he also spoke about uh, data fusion during the surgical procedure, allowing you to have, in essence, x-ray vision. In addition to that, adding artificial intelligence to assist you during surgery to help uh, interpret what the... Uh, pathology would be, for example, in cancer surgery of the liver to be able to, to be able to analyze with spectral analysis in real time the vapor that is being emitted from the dissection to determine whether it was cancer or normal tissue, uh, providing a better opportunity for assessing your margins. Uh, in addition to that, he spoke about uh, his simulation and training experience of over 25 years. His institutes are called IRCAD, and there are now nine of them globally, not only in his home of Strasbourg, but also in Taiwan, uh, and new ones that are beginning in Rwanda and uh, Lebanon and a number of other areas uh, in Brazil. So he has uh, contributed dramatically to the improvement of robotic surgery, and we can look forward to many new things from him. In addition to that, we had uh, R. Darcy speaking about uh, 
his individual um, work at uh, uh, London as well. He is looking now at nanotechnology and he's also including uh, what he called digital surgery, which is the use of information for the longitudinal performance of surgery, meaning from the pre-op phase to the intraoperative phase to the post-operative phase and the long-term follow-up and uh, creating uh, a, a longitudinal study so that we have a comprehensive view of the performance of surgery. And then the final uh, person that was able to be in our session was Dr. Satch Deva from the American College of Surgeons. He is the director of the American College of Surgeons and he was emphasizing upon where we're going to be once we emerge from the uh, COVID-19 crisis that we are in at the moment. Right now, as we speak and we're personally experiencing, our meetings have been canceled and now we're trying to go virtual, which has forced uh, medicine, not only in surgery, but in medicine in general, to depend upon the use of telemedicine. And therefore, what has previously been ignored now is going to be taking a larger prominence, and in particularly in the area of simulation and training. Uh, he designated the areas that are going to be of interest for the American College of Surgeons are the three periods of a surgeon's career, meaning when they initially begin their surgical pro uh, career professionally with their own patients, at the uh, middle of their career when they have gotten their experience and they're moving towards expertise, and then finally when they are finishing their career, how they can stay engaged. Uh, the senior surgeons, uh, not only by clinical practice and mentoring, but also about education, training, and research. The college is putting in an enormous effort uh, and investing in the future of surgical education from online classes and webinars to uh, developing artificial intelligence and how it can be exploited for all the aspects of surgery. And finally, the use of new technologies, ed education and training called technology enhanced learning, which of course includes things such as digital imaging, uh, simulation and training, and artificial intelligence. Uh, all of these will be then integrated into a hybrid type of educational institute uh, that the college is becoming in which you can have online learning, you can have real-time telemedicine for learning or teleproctoring, uh, and where we would go in the future uh, when it comes to putting on conferences. In the future, will our conferences be hybrid, partially face-to-face -face and partially uh, on telemedicine form? So it's very interesting that they, meaning the college, uh, who are the leadership within the surgical profession, are aggressively attempting to make a, an enormous translation from where we have been in the past to where we will be in the future with a huge dependence upon technology. So I think the future looks bright. It's going to be dramatically different than before. And as uh, Vip had said a moment ago, um, and to quote uh, uh, the, the catcher, the future is not what it used to be. Thank you very much. Yeah, Rick, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, we all consider you the father of robotic surgery. You started it all. And without you, you know, none of the last 20, 25 years would really have happened or gone the same way. So um, we have a, a different debt of gratitude to you, uh, I think, uh, above and beyond everybody else. So it's an honor that uh, you worked with us and, and we really took uh, great credence in your uh, inspiration. And I'm sure the rest of the faculty would echo that. Andrew. Well, uh, Vip, remember about a year ago when we uh, last, the society met for the uh, last time in person uh, in Orlando, I had pitched the idea of doing 
a session during the plenary uh, on AI. And, and I wanted to, first of all, thank you for uh, taking that risk and, and uh, giving us a chance to show what uh, specifically uh, AI can do in terms of uh, a robotic surgery. And this year, as the inaugural session on uh, machine learning, I, I wanted to really focus on one specific topic, and that is uh, automating surgical assessment. And uh, we uh, had a fantastic lineup from uh, both uh, academ academia as well as industry. Uh, so we had three state-of-the-art talks, uh, first from uh, Dan Soyanov uh, from University College London, uh, as well as from Anand Malpani uh, from the Premier Robotics Lab at Johns Hopkins. And the two uh, talked about you know, the progress that has been made using both kinematic metrics as well as uh, computer vision to not only recognize what surgery is being done, uh, but also kind of laying the foundational work of assessing uh, actual technical skill. And I think that is uh, certainly uh, within our future. Uh, and I also myself uh, presented some of our work in automated performance metrics and how they are linked to uh, short-term and long-term clinical outcomes after uh, the robotic prostatectomy, for example. And, and I would say that the work that we're doing here in these research labs uh, are not only foundational to automating uh, surgical performance, uh, which you know, in of itself is, is truly innovative and would really transform how we train and assess our surgeons because you know, to date, the way that we assess surgeons is, is manually done, it's subjective, and we really don't have a scalable objective way of assessing surgery. And, and really ensuring that there is a baseline standard that we all adhere to. And so uh, the, the future in that regard, I think, uh, will transform uh, with uh, a lot of, especially the innovations in deep learning. The second part of our session was uh, a, a talks from our industry partners. Uh, we had uh, Tony Jark, who, was, uh, who is uh, the Director of Data and Analytics from Intuitive Surgical. We had Pablo Garcia Kilroy, who is the Vice President of Digital Solutions from Johnson & Johnson. And we also had the privilege of having Andre Chow, who is uh, the Vice President of Digital Surgery uh, from uh, Surgical Robotics and Medtronics. As some may know, he uh, was the co-founder of uh, Touch Surgery, uh, which uh, Medtronics recently acquired. So each of the three of them gave a, a, a vision of, of, uh, from their respective companies of how they envision uh, AI playing uh, in uh, surgical robots. And uh, we had the pleasure of doing a fireside chat. It was, a, in fact, a, a fireless fireside chat uh, with uh, Marti, uh, Marty Martino as my uh, co-moderator. And we, we had a, a fantastic discussion uh, about, you know, what are the common interests? And we discussed specifically that actually a lot of the things that we hope to do as a, not only a society, as a discipline, uh, are very common, and so we we discussed whether uh, you know defining uh, very common metrics and endpoints made sense, and I think the consensus was yes. Uh, and so there, although uh, obviously uh, from a commercial standpoint, companies are competitors, that there are certain things that uh, perhaps should be standardized for the common good of both uh, the surgeon and as well as uh, the patient. And uh, we discussed, you know, what are the priorities from each of these uh, uh, commercial entities, uh, and also what are the challenges uh, that they face. And honestly, I, I think I, I, I'm really looking forward to uh, growing this uh, this uh, group uh, discussion. And I'm I'm looking forward to already next year when perhaps we can bring in more of our industry partners and and having this discussion. It really was a great opportunity to. Uh, bring together not only the academics, the surgeons, as well as the industry leaders. And so, Vip, again, thank you so much for giving us that opportunity to uh, make that happen this year. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. It was a phenomenal session. I, I can't tell you I understood every part of it, <laughs> but it was very futuristic, and, and this is the reality. Uh, you know, AI, automation, and so forth is where we need to go in the future. And, you know, we definitely thank you as one of our brightest stars in, in urology, and uh, we really appreciate your forward-thinking vision. And yeah, we look forward to having you here, hopefully in person in Orlando in 2021. And uh, we'll, we'll hopefully do this session in an even more futuristic way. So thank you again. Uh, Uma, I'm not sure if, uh, if you're there. 
You may not. Oh, there he is. Uma, some, some last words before I finish off? Sure, Will. Uh, I, I think that uh, my colleagues have really summarized elegantly a lot of the work that's already gone into this uh, plenary session. It was an honor to be involved. Thank you for allowing, uh, allowing me to participate. Uh, I, I will speak from the perspective of uh, a burgeoning field in robotics or langology. Head and neck surgery has not traditionally had the footprint in uh, robotic surgery, or I should say the other way around. Robotics has not had as big of a footprint in our field as it has in neurology and general surgery and gynecology. But some of the topics that we have addressed at this uh, plenary session, I think, cross the disciplines. And that's what I see as being so particularly interesting and innovative, both that the future is here and some of the uh, elegant work that Dr. Satava presented, as well as where we're going in the future with 5G and other applications that will not only allow us to do the surgeries we do now better, as in urology or general surgery, but maybe actually open up the field to, um, to specialties that have not traditionally uh, explored robotics, uh, bony surgery, orthopedics, uh, head and neck, as an example, et cetera. So it's, it's really a, a wonderful time to be in the field. And uh, of course, we stand on the shoulders of those that have paved the way for us, Dr. Monosco, Dr. Satava, and others. And so I think this is just a, a, a fantastic meeting, and I look forward to seeing its uh, culmination in the near future. Yeah, Uma, thank you. It's, it's always great. Uh, you've been with us for many years with SRS, and uh, we appreciate you uh, always helping out, uh, but especially your vision and your excitement for the future. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll round it off, and I think the very last session uh, after this talk is, is quite interesting. Uh, it's not only the future of robotic surgery, but it's the future surgeons. Um, and so we actually have a teen session to end this. Uh, we have teens from all over the world who have actually gotten together. They've watched these videos and they've interviewed some of you as their mentors. And the kids will finish it off and they'll talk about how surgery will affect them, how they will actually learn how to do surgery. And so I encourage you guys to log on and ask the teens questions. Uh, they're very articulate and I think it's a great appropriate way to finish this session with our next generation, and that's how we'll do it. Once again, guys, thank you so much. Um, I have to say it's uh, an honor, a pleasure. It's, it's, been, it's been excellent, and I think we've all learned a bunch, and we'll do it again in uh, 2021 in Orlando. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Vip. Thank you. Thank you.